Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is just a very devastating case. The way that it all happened was so very senseless, but the way the investigators were able to pull together the timeline and get all of the evidence together to bring the perpetrator to justice is really interesting and I am very happy that there is justice in this case. So I wanted to go ahead and share this case with you all. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Native. Those of you who have been watching my channel for some time now know just how much I love working with Native. I love their products, especially their body washes. When I look for a body wash, I look for something with simple, clean ingredients that will give me a nice, fresh, clean scent. I love Native's body washes for those exact reasons. Native Body Wash gives you a luxurious foamy lather without any of these sulfated surfactants. Their body washes are also folate and dye-free, it's vegan and cruelty-free, and made with plant-based cleansers. Plus, it's made with citric acid for pH balance to keep your skin happy and fresh. I love that their body wash keeps me feeling fresh and clean without any residue, leaving my skin feeling silky and smooth. The other thing that is amazing about Native that I love a lot is their wide variety of scent choices with new scents being released all of the time. There literally are so many different scents and just when you think that you've tried them all, they come out with even more scents all of the time. I personally have sandalwood and shea butter. This scent is so fresh and nice. It's definitely one of those scents that is completely versatile and I think everybody will love this scent. This is my go-to for everyday scents. Then I have my absolute favorite, lilac and white tea. I am literally in love with this scent. This one is subtle and fresh with having that amazing floral sweet smell that I absolutely love. Then I have a body wash from Native's new Candy Shop collection. This is a collection of obnoxiously creative Candy Shop inspired scents that I love. They're so colorful and really honestly very unique. Satisfy that sweet tooth with an explosion of color, fragrance, and fun scent choices like gummy bears, sweet cinnamon hearts, sour berry belts, and strawberry and vanilla taffy. I have their Gummy Bears Body Wash, and oh my goodness, this is my favorite scent of all of the Candy Shop scents. It's so sugary, sweet, and fun. I was actually wearing this one the other day at work. I also have the deodorant, and I just kept smelling this amazing sweet smell, and I was like, what is that? And I'm like, that's me. It's amazing. I love it. But beyond their body washes, Native also has more to offer. You can find products for all of your personal care needs. They have amazing deodorants that I use literally every single day and new hand and body lotion. Treat yourself to the ultimate self-care package and let me tell you, you do not want to miss out on their new limited edition scents. Right now, Native has a special offer for my subscribers. You can get 20% off of your first purchase at Native when you use my link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON14. This offer is site-wide, but only for a limited time, so make sure you stock up and save. Again, use my code RACHELSHANNON14 or use the link down below for 20% off of your Native products site-wide. Thank you again so much to Native for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic Savopoulos family murders. Savas Savopoulos was born on September 25th, 1968 in Cheverly, Maryland to parents Philip and Gail. From the time Savas was 17 years old, he loved martial arts and was described as having excelled in it. He always dreamed of someday owning a traditional Japanese-style martial arts center someday. Savas went on to earn his Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of Maryland, where he studied business and analytic philosophy. Then he went on to get his law degree from American University. However, he also enjoyed engineering and was known to have innovative ideas. He was also known to be a philanthropist, donating time and money to various charitable organizations throughout his life, such as Starlight Children's Foundation, Children's National Medical Center, the National Child Research Center, and St. Sophia Greek Orthodox Cathedral. He loved the opera, traveling, and was a skilled photographer. He was described as being loyal, empathetic, compassionate, and courageous. 
By the time of his death, he was the CEO of American Ironworks, which is a leading custom steel and iron manufacturing company that helped build the Capital One Arena and the city center DC. He was also the CEO of Sigma Investment Strategies. He had just also recently opened a massive martial arts center that boasted 2,000 square feet of mat space, two libraries, a kitchen, and a living quarters for students who wanted to excel in the pursuit of martial arts to live in his dream had come to fruition. Those who worked for Savas and knew him professionally all said that he was the best kind of person that you could work for. He didn't act like a big shot. He was fair-minded, well-mannered, and friendly. He was motivated, driven, and cared about everybody that he worked with. By June 4th, 1994, Savas got married to Amy Savopoulos at the St. Sophia Greek Orthodox Cathedral. Amy was born on April 8, 1968 in Brigham, Massachusetts to parents James Martin and Rhonda Martin. Amy was raised in a military family with her younger brother, John. Growing up, Amy learned to be a citizen of the world. She attended Department of Defense schools in Germany as well as numerous other army bases across the U.S. She graduated from the University of Maryland with a degree in economics and after that, she worked at Con Resnick Accounting for a few years. The couple went on to have three children, Abigail, Katrina, and Philip. Amy's unique upbringing allowed her to gain, quote, important values that were reflected in her remarkable life as a wife, mother, daughter, sister, friend, neighbor, as well as an engaged community member. She was known for her selfless nature, and she was devoted to her three children. She was known to be very involved in her children's schools and helped organize many community fundraisers and other school events. She loved golfing, playing tennis, and going on long walks with her family. She too loved traveling the world and loved everything that involved the arts. She loved touring galleries, going to monuments, and attending performing arts. Their son, 10-year-old Philip, who went by Flip by his friends, was born in Silver Spring, Maryland on March 1st, 2005. He was a fourth grade student at St. Albans School for Boys, and there he excelled in sports and academics. He played outfield and third base for his Little League baseball team. He was described as having an encyclopedic knowledge of baseball statistics and players. His favorite athlete was Kevin Durant, who at the time played for the Oklahoma City Thunder. He had dreams of becoming a professional Formula One race car driver. His true passion was racing and going fast. He was a member of the Praga North American Karting Race Team, where he raced competitively. He was very proud of his Greek heritage and was interested in learning his mother's ancestry as well. 19-year-old Abigail and 16-year-old Katrina absolutely doted over their little brother, Philip. They all took an active interest in each other's lives, the three of them, and unlike most trio of siblings, they all actively looked for more opportunities to spend time together. The three siblings loved watching movies together, with their favorite movie being Finding Nemo. They were all known for having an unusually close sibling relationship for their ages. The family lived in a $4.5 million mansion in Washington, D.C., where they had a 57-year-old housekeeper named Veralicia Figiora. Veralicia was a wife and a mother who grew up in extreme poverty in El Salvador. By 2002, she decided that she wanted to give her children a better life. She wanted to find employment that allowed her to help pay for her children to go to college, so she moved to Washington, D.C. She was ecstatic when she got the job with the prestigious Savopoulos family. When she started, she was able to set aside tuition money for her children each week. Then, she was able to send her children, who still lived in El Salvador, to college. After they graduated, her son worked as an engineer and her daughter worked as a supply manager at a hospital. She absolutely loved her children and was so proud of them. She was proud that she was able to put her children through school and after they graduated from college, she was planning on returning back to El Salvador to be with them again. However, that dream and all other big plans for the family were cut short suddenly and for no reason on the afternoon of May 14th, 2015. That day, firefighters responded to the mansion for reports of a fire at the home. Once the fire was under control, they entered the home 
only to find the bodies of three adults and one child. However, as the firefighters started pulling their bodies out of the home, they realized that these victims had not been killed by a house fire. They had injuries all over their bodies that indicated that they had been beaten and stabbed to death before the fire was set to the home. Very quickly, after other officers arrived on the scene, police were able to identify the victims as 46-year-old Savas, 47-year-old Amy, 10-year-old Philip, and 57-year-old Veralicia. Inside the home, they found that there was blood all over the floor. Then they found a bloody baseball bat on one of the beds. Philip had been found in his bedroom. He was thought to have been killed by thermal and sharp force injuries. It's thought that he was stabbed with a sword that Philip had as a collectible from his father's martial arts collection. Then all of the adults were found, I believe, in the master bedroom. I don't think it's been stated very clearly which bedroom they were found in, but they were all found together in one room where Philip was found in his own bedroom. The adults were found tied to chairs, most likely with some sort of adhesive tape or zip ties. Amy and Savas were found to have been beaten with a baseball bat and stabbed. Amy's right middle finger was bruised and she had injuries consistent with somebody trying to pull a ring off. Vera had the least amount of injuries, though she was stabbed in the neck. She also had a history of heart disease, so it's thought that she may have suffered a heart attack during this attack. Then police found two Domino's pizza boxes in the same room where the three adults were found. Upon investigation, they also found that the fire had been started in Philip's room. Investigators then found that the home had a very sophisticated security system, but it had not been triggered at any point, so that meant that the family either knew the perpetrator and let them in willingly, or it was someone with intricate knowledge of the house and knew how to disarm their security system. The police were then able to put together a timeline of events leading up to the house fire, which I will discuss now. On May 13th, Philip stayed home from school because he wasn't feeling well. By 9.30 a.m. that day, Amy took Philip to a doctor's appointment, which they left at 10.47 a.m. according to a parking ticket found inside of the car. So, by 3 p.m. on May 13th, the family's second housekeeper, who was going by the name of Nellie, her name is publicly identified now, but I'm not going to say it just for the sake of her own safety. She didn't want it released because of that, but of course it was, but I'm going to call her Nellie at this point. Either way, she started to get concerned because Vera was supposed to be finishing up her day of work at that time. Then, by 5.30 p.m., Amy called her husband asking him to come home to watch their son, Philip. Now, at this time, thankfully, Abigail and Katrina were out of the house because they were attending boarding school. So, Amy asked Savas to come home so that she could leave the house so Philip would have someone to be with. By 9 p.m., Nellie finally heard from Savas. He left her a voice message saying not to come into work the next day because Vera was going to be spending the night at the family home. He also mentioned that Vera's cell phone was dead and that they didn't have a charger, so that's why Nellie wasn't able to get a hold of her. But Nellie immediately thought that this was strange. She thought that the whole situation was strange because the family never had either of them sleep over, so she didn't know why today, all of a sudden, they were having Vera stay the night at their house. By 9.14 p.m., someone in the house ordered two Domino's pizzas to be delivered to the home. They were paid for using Amy's credit card, and I believe the order name was Amy's as well. When she put in the order, according to the delivery driver, Amy told him that she was taking care of a sick child and wasn't able to come to the door. She asked that the delivery driver put the pizzas on the porch, ring the doorbell, and leave. When the delivery person got to the house, he noticed that all of the lights in the house were out and only the light on the front porch was on. He left the pizzas on the porch as requested. At some point that night, Savas' assistant was called and Savas left him a voicemail instructing him to go to the bank and withdraw $40,000 from the company bank account and then deliver it to the home that next morning. He didn't know why Savas made this request and he definitely thought that it was strange, 
but Savas was the boss, so the assistant didn't question it. By 9.30 a.m. on March 14th, Vera's husband grew concerned for her well-being, so he went to the home and knocked on the door. Nobody answered, but he had this feeling that somebody was inside. But while he was doing that, knocking on the door, trying to get his wife to come out, he got a call on his phone from Savas saying that Vera had actually been taken to the hospital and was not in the home. By 9.40 a.m., Nellie got a text from Amy's phone which read, I'm making sure you don't come into work today. Nellie called Amy, but the call went straight to voicemail. She texted Amy back, but Amy never answered. After that, that morning, Savas's assistant dropped off that $40,000 in an envelope, placing it in the front seat of one of the cars in the garage as he was instructed. By 12.10 p.m. that same day, a neighbor saw a man walk into the garage of the Savopolis' home. After that, a witness called and said that they saw someone driving Amy's blue Porsche heading outbound on New York Avenue at around 1.30 p.m. that same afternoon. The witness described the driver as being a black male with short, well-groomed hair wearing a lime green construction vest. That same afternoon, police ended up finding the Porsche completely burnt up in a church parking lot in New Carrollton, Maryland, just a few neighborhoods over from the home. Inside the burnt up car was a neon green construction vest. Then, as we know, by 1.30 p.m. on May 14th, 911 was called to report that the house had been burning. So, it is believed that sometime between 11 and 3 p.m. on May 13th, someone entered the home while Amy was out on a walk. Then, the perpetrator was able to restrain both Philip and Vera. When Amy came home, they say that they were able to restrain her as well. Then, they most likely had Amy call Savas to come to the home, and obviously, he wasn't really expecting someone else to be there, so when he got home, the perpetrator restrained him as well. While they were restrained, it's believed that each one of these victims was subjected to various violent acts and torture. This included beatings, stabbings, and being strangled, as well as being doused with gasoline. It's believed that Philip was tortured the worst out of everybody, possibly as a way to get Savas to call that assistant to hand over the money. It's thought that Savas was forced to call his assistant to bring over that money, all in $100 bills. Then, once the cash was delivered, it's thought that each victim was finally murdered and the house was set on fire to damage any evidence that was inside the house. Now, like I said, there was a pizza box found in the bedroom where the adult victims were found. In that pizza box, they found some pizza crust, and on that pizza crust, they found DNA. According to investigators, the perpetrator ate the pizza with gloves on to avoid fingerprinting or other DNA evidence, failing to realize that his saliva was going to get on the pizza as well, and his saliva had DNA as well. Then, in one of the bedrooms, they also found a sword, which I believe was also used in the stabbings. Like I said, it's believed that Philip was stabbed with the sword. Then, they found a knife that had been propped between a windowsill and a window. This also had DNA on it, which matched the DNA found on the pizza crust. Then, they put the DNA into a phenotyping system to create an image of what the person would look like. Then, they put the DNA into a national database and compared the DNA to other DNA profiles of people who had committed crimes before. Then, using this, they found a potential match. The DNA came back to matching a 34-year-old man named Darren Wint. He matched the description of the man who was seen entering the family's garage on the afternoon of the murders and then the man who was seen driving Amy's Porsche. Then, they were able to use his cell phone data and the statements from the other witnesses to track his movements from that day. So, at around 6 p.m. on the same day as the murders, he used his iPhone to search the internet to see how to remove the iCloud feature from a phone. Then, he called his girlfriend and asked her if cell phones could be traced. Then, on his phone, he searched the internet on how to beat a lie detector test. Then, the person looked up a fire on Woodland Drive, which was the Savopolis' street. Then, the following day on May 15th, apparently, he went to the gym with a friend and was flashing around $1,200 in cash, 
all of which were in $100 bills. Then that same night, Darren had called a friend to see if they would help him in burning his minivan, which the friend declined, but then the same night, investigators found that his minivan had been set on fire. So that is the information that they had that all pointed towards Darren in addition to his DNA being on the knife in the home as well as on that pizza crust. Then, like I said, that green vest was also found in Amy's burnt up Porsche. His DNA was also found on that vest. But once police had finally identified Darren as their suspect, he was nowhere to be found. And from there, the manhunt for this man had started. Authorities knew the vehicle that Darren was most likely traveling in. They tracked the car down until they caught up with him on May 20th, so about a week after the murders, when they found him in the parking lot of an Express Inn in Maryland. He initially flew to New York and then ended up in Maryland, where he was later found. It turned out that on May 16th, Darren went to visit his girlfriend in New York. Once again, he was flashing around all this money, all in $100 bills, and he was buying all these nice things. Then it was found that he was still continuously doing searches relating to the home on his cell phone. Then he started searching hideout cities for fugitives and things like that. While in New York, apparently he saw an article about the murders along with a picture of him. So, he got a taxi back to DC and told his girlfriend that he was going to turn himself in. Later that same day, Darren got into contact with his brother, Daryl, who then contacted a friend to get help in hiring a lawyer. Then, I guess, to get the money to the lawyer, he was probably going to pay for the lawyer using the money that he stole, but Daryl and the friend stopped by the hotel in Maryland to pick Darren up, and I believe that is when police found them and apprehended all of them. In that car, they found $7,300 in cash in the car that Daryl was in, but I guess Darren was in a different car and there was no cash found in that car, so... What I get from that is that it's believed that Darren gave all of the cash that he had to Daryl to hold on to either to get him a lawyer or something like that. And then Darren was planning on taking a different car either to get away or again, to get a lawyer so he could turn himself in. Either way, from there, he was arrested and charged with first degree murder, arson, and kidnapping, among other charges. Now that they had found the identity of Darren, the question now is how he knew the family and how he chose to target them. It turned out that Darren was employed by American Ironworks from 2003 to 2005, so Savas's company. He was reportedly fired from this job in 2005 after he threatened a coworker with a knife. After losing that job, he had a hard time finding and keeping another job. He asked to be rehired by the company in 2008 and again in 2009. Then, in 2010, he was arrested at a gas station across the street from American Ironworks headquarters building. At this time, he had a gun and a machete with him. Again, I don't exactly know what he was planning on doing, if he was planning on going into the American Ironworks headquarters building or what he was planning on doing. All I know was that he was arrested at that gas station and he had these weapons on him. He is also known to have a past criminal history that included other forms of violence. During the mid-2000s, he has had four different people, including his own father and a roommate, all file petitions for restraining orders against him. But other than that, we don't know a true motive for his crime. We know that it probably was money, just looking at it from the outside. Maybe it was some sort of revenge for him not getting hired by the company again. Maybe Darren blamed Savas for having no money and no job. Even through the trial, the aftermath, everything, Darren has never admitted to doing this or obviously why he did this. The trial started in September of 2018, and he was being charged with 20 counts, including first-degree murder, arson, and kidnapping. To these charges, he pled not guilty. The prosecution argued that Darren went to the home and held the family and Vera hostage overnight by restraining them with zip ties or tape, ordered a pizza for himself, and then tortured them until he got his $40,000, 
before murdering Philip, Amy, Savas, and Vera, and then setting the house on fire to destroy the evidence. They pointed to the evidence that we discussed earlier this far, as far as witness statements, DNA, and the information on his cell phone. However, Darren's public defender actually argued that Darren is not guilty. There are two others responsible for these crimes. She said that Darren's half-brothers actually committed the murders. She said that Darren was told to come to the home by his brothers. She said that he arrived at the home, but stayed downstairs the entire time. They said that he had no idea this entire time that the four victims were upstairs, bound and beaten. They basically said that Darren was lured over to the house to help out with all of this, but when he got there, he had no idea that the victims were inside the home. So, they argued that several others are actually responsible for the crime and that Darren left the home without any knowledge of what happened and he was not involved in anything that happened either. The prosecution argued that the motive for this was robbery. However, the defense pointed out how several of the crime scene photos show that many valuables were left in the home. This includes a Rolex watch, wallet, cash, and several large unopened safes in the house and the garage. Why would they leave these things if the motive was money? And I don't honestly know either. He had that $40,000 delivered, but why would he not take as much as he could before leaving? Some criminals are stupid. Some just don't see these things. I don't know. Maybe in the heat of the moment, or maybe robbery wasn't the true motive. Maybe it truly was revenge. We might not ever know, truly. Either way, Darren's stepmother, who he lived with at the time, testified that Darren did not show up at home on the night of May 13th, so he had been somewhere all night. Then there was information to confirm that the two brothers that the defense was pinning this on, both of them were at work at some point that day, so their alibis show that they were not available to have done these crimes at least part of the time that these crimes were taking place, so not necessarily that they were gone from those exact hours, but they had work the day before, they had work the day after, and nobody is saying that they left or came back at weird times or were acting weird in any sort of way, so it seems like they have pretty solid alibis to show that they were not responsible. Now, during the initial stages of this investigation, authorities were saying that it seems like multiple people had to have been involved with this crime just based on how it went down. But by the time the trial happened, the prosecution didn't even really mention that fact. There was really no mention of the fact that it was thought to have been committed by multiple people, so that's something that the defense was arguing, that there's no way that this one person could be solely responsible. They thought that there had to have been multiple people involved, but even if there was multiple people involved, he's the only one that was implicated. Only his DNA was there. Only he had a connection to the family, and only he had these weird internet searches on his phone, and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. At the end of the trial, the jury came to their verdict. The jury found Darren Wint guilty on all 20 counts of first-degree murder, kidnapping, burglary, extortion, arson, and theft, and for this, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He did put in an appeal after this. He tried to get a shorter sentence, all of that, but of course, that was denied. This case was absolutely brutal, and everybody involved knew that. They saw just how brutal and tragic this whole case was. The fact that somebody went into a house, even if it was for revenge, even if it was for money, went into that house and tortured three people that had nothing even to do with the company that he was fired from is just nonsense. Obviously, this whole case to begin with, Savas didn't deserve this either, of course, but the fact that this person took the lives of three other people that had absolutely nothing to do with any of that, that's just unreasonable and it makes me think that there was more to this than just revenge or just money. I think this is a sick person who chose to do this. And again, some people might disagree with me to an extent, but in my opinion, when you kill an adult versus a child, you have to be a whole different type of horrific person to be able to kill a child. Not that it's okay to kill another adult, 
But like killing a child is like another layer of that. You have to be another level of completely messed up. So the fact that this man killed the family, killed the adult, not only that, but also chose to take the life of this 10-year-old child and torture him to get his dad allegedly or apparently to give over some money. $40,000, by the way, isn't even that much in the grand scheme of things. It's definitely not worth four people's lives, but that's just me. But I mean, the fact that he was tortured says a lot about the character of the person who committed this, and that most likely is Darren. And if he had help, unfortunately, those people have not been caught. But I personally think that the way it went down, I do think it's possible that one person committed this. I think that if he went in there with weapons and easily overpowered a 10-year-old, easily overpowered a 57-year-old woman, and then as they were tied up, Amy was caught off guard and maybe she was threatened that if she didn't comply that he would kill the other two. And then when, you know, Savas got home, that is when he did the same thing to him. I think that if all four of them were home at the same time that I can definitely see how it would be almost impossible for one person to be responsible. But the fact that they all came home at different times and the fact that the only two at home, apparently according to authorities, when he came in was a 10 year old and a 57 year old woman i think it definitely makes it more possible because really all you have to do is overpower one of them and threaten the life of that one to get everybody else to comply so in reality i do think it's possible that he was the only person involved and again all the evidence points towards that so i think he's the only person involved and i think he's a sick person i think he's absolutely sick and the fact that he's never admitted why he did it or that he did it is also sick take responsibility for what you did that's all i have to say but that is where i will end the case today that's where it stands today the sisters are still alive and they're doing well i believe one or both of them are engaged or married they went to college and they're living their lives to the fullest that they possibly can but I'm sure this tragedy was just the most devastating thing that can possibly happen. They both lost their parents, their baby brother, and that literally is the most traumatic thing that you could possibly go through. It's just heartbreaking. My heart absolutely breaks for them. Same for Vera's children and her husband to know that she moved out of the U.S. to make a better life for her children and she did. She was able to save the money. She was able to send her children to college and make their lives way better than she ever had it. The, the fact that she did that and then she started her plan to come back to her kids and live out the rest of her life with her children who she was proud of and provided for and she never got the chance to do that murdered for literally literally no reason literally just wrong place at the wrong time is absolutely devastating and heartbreaking this entire thing is just bone chillingly heartbreaking it's horrible like i said no one has ever really found a motive for this all we know is that he did work for savas so that is most likely how he knew him he had trouble finding a job after he was fired for his own poor behavior and then he murdered everybody in the home years later and burned their house down. It's just a very disturbing, tragic, horrible situation, and my heart is absolutely broken for the family and Vera. But that is where I'm going to end today's video, and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. What do you think the motive was here? Do you think it's possible that somebody else, like Darren's brothers, are involved? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and use my link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON14 to get 20% off of native site-wide. You do not want to miss that deal. Make sure you stack up now. Also, make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.